bio. Um, we have Clark on the left with his work. Clark is from Colorado Springs. He lives and works in Fort Collins, where he is a third year MFA candidate at Colorado State University. And you're actually graduating. Yeah, next week. Next week! Yeah. Yay! Um, and we have Courtney, who's a visual artist living and working in Longmont now. Um, Courtney went to the University of Oregon with a focus in painting. Um, and you guys, just let's start with Courtney and tell us a little bit about your practice and who you are and how you kind of got to where you are as, a, as an artist. Okay, so my name is Courtney Gimlin. As Brandy mentioned, I'm a, a practicing artist located in Longmont as of about a year ago. Um, and I'm primarily a painter. I also write poetry. I have a secret goal of making a like illustrated book of poetry one day. Um, and graduated from the University of Oregon um, with a being in art and a focus in painting and drawing. Um, and in my art practice, I really explore this need for like, mental wellness um, and connection through what I think is our primary resource, which is energy. Um, and by that, I mean this idea that we're all connected energetically. Um, and so I explore that visually um, and try to understand it more through my practice. And um, it didn't always work in abstract, and I didn't always have this kind of conceptual idea for my work. I think I used to be more of a realistic painter until my senior year of college. Um, and the last project I did, I was like, I'm just gonna try abstract. And it was, it really changed, I think, my relationship with art and um, was really freeing. And so I started exploring all these other concepts in my work. Um, and one of the things that I kind of came to realize around the same time was that I had come to identify with this like, this artist stereotype, I think of like the starving artist or like that there's like mental anguish makes like really good art. Um, <laughs> like <laughs> Vincent Van Gogh or Sylvia Plath and these are just things I didn't really realize and then I was like, this is not what I want. Um, and I, at the time, was facing graduation and was kind of going through some mental health struggles. And so I took a step back from art, like right as I graduated, and I didn't hit the typical showing your art scene. And I decided to focus on myself and my healing. Um, and as part of that process, I think I realized they also need to like rediscover like who I was as an artist. If this was not like at the center of my work than like what was. Uh, so I spent a few years kind of on my own path exploring self-growth and um, kind of spirituality. I got really interested in this idea of like this spiritual world and what that might mean and what that might look like. Um, and that kind of introduced me to this idea of energy. Um, I'm not a scientist, and somehow I got really interested in quantum physics um, and this idea of connection. And so I started exploring these ideas in my practice. Um, and at some point, I just was like, "This is it. This is this is my voice as an artist, as a healed person." And I really wanted my works to be intentional. Like if I was going to release them out into the world, they wanted to feel like they're part of this energy we all share. And so I wanted to be in alignment and authentic with them before I shared them. Um, so that's been kind of my, my journey so far. I've been making this work about energy for about seven years now. Um, and these works are part of a series called The Architecture of Energy. And I feel like that's kind of like the culmination of the last seven years and exploring this idea. Um, yeah, that's about me and me and Thank my work. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, in planning this show, um, what I loved is the back and forth between your works, and I'll probably say that again, but it is my transition to introducing 
Clark again. So tell us about your journey that brought you to making the work that you make now. Yeah, well, my name's Clark Valentine. Um, as mentioned, I'm a third year MFA candidate at Colorado State University. I graduate next week. I did my <coughs> undergraduate degree at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Um, and my concentration for my MFA was in drawing. And I'm really interested in um, what I would classify as the phenomenology of mark making, phenomenology being um, this like balance between like physical experience and how that relates to the emergence of consciousness or of identity. Um, so my drawings are really centered on every mark that I make becomes kind of this autobiographical documentation of not only the time that I spend in making, but also of um, like my emotional, physical um, state of mind or spiritual state of mind as I'm making. So um, just to kind of, I think, lay out the process, I think that's the clearest way to explain the work. Um, what I do most often, um, I think this is in the camera frame, but I start uh, most often with a straight line somewhere, usually in the middle of my paper, although that changes, and I leave myself kind of a border around the edges. So my first line is established using a ruler. So a ruled out line in the center of the page. And then what I'm attempting to do as I radiate out from the center of this piece is I'm trying to replicate the previous line as exactly as possible. So after I draw this first line, then I'm following along, I'm trying to replicate that line, and inevitably some sort of disruption occurs with my hand. And as I try to replicate then that second line, that disruption becomes accentuated, another disruption of that line occurs, and that kind of builds itself over time. So um, I'm really interested in the last mark mm -hmm. in one of these processes because I think it exists in like perfect spontaneity. If I just took a blank sheet of paper and tried to lay a single line that was quote unquote spontaneous onto the page, it would be informed by like, my own cognition. Every line that I've seen before that I perceive to be spontaneous would be informing this. But this process allows me to find these forms that are really um, directly correlated to the natural movements that my hand wants to create. So I'm trying to move through a state of like hyper intense focus and then from there find this moment of zen or spontaneity within that moment of freedom. Um, my work is really um, informed by spiritual practices, specifically meditative practices, and this becomes um, my own way to kind of document uh, a, medita a meditative practice that I've built myself. So each of these um, becomes like a process that I enter into and exit um, as I'm kind of documenting the change of myself over time. That's lovely. That's so specifically personal in a way that you might maybe not expect looking at the work. Yeah. And I feel the same way about Courtney's work. You know, you're talking about expelling energy and you see that very literally in the mark making that you're doing as well in these pieces. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us more about the specific series that these belong to? Yes. Um, so these are all from this body of work called The Architecture of Energy. Um, okay, so this series explores how everything is made up of the same energy yeah. um, and how all of our interactions um, in the day-to-day -day life are just exchanges of this energy um, and how these exchanges kind of shape our energetic experiences um, and how our energetic experiences kind of form who we are as people and then from there form the world around us. Um, so like I mentioned before, there's three <laughs> sub-series in this body of work. Um, so the works in the gallery today are from the first sub-series, which is called Universal Energy. Um, and these works are a visual representation of this visceral experience of energy um, <coughs> alongside the geometric, like what I call building blocks, these more bold, filled in geometric shapes um, that kind of shape our reality. Um, and so one thing I kind of am intrigued by 
that I explore in this particular part of the series is this idea that there is this kind of collective, invisible, like, ocean of energy that we pull from and that kind of filters in and out of really everything that we see and interact with. Um, and so the gestural marks at the bottom, they're all kind of like black oceans, were also um, really meditative in my practice to kind of step into this space and I, I meditated to kind of get into a space and then finger painted and kind of just went with that experience. Um, and then those building blocks kind of stem from that, that energy pool, if you will. Um, the second part, I brought some just to show you. So the second part of the series is um, called Energy from the Earth. So this is a series of pieces on paper. So this is one of the pieces. Um, so all of these pieces have a black background. Um, and that's a mixture of charcoal and medium. Um, and this decision to use charcoal kind of set the palette for this whole grouping of paintings. Um, I'm really intrigued by charcoal as a medium. And so I think in one, in one way, it stems from destruction, right? Like if you have a forest fire, everything gets destroyed. But what's left is charcoal, and charcoal is super nutrient dense and it's like this perfect material and catalyst for fresh growth um, which I just think is such a great metaphor and so this body of work um, explores the idea of energy as like a life force and a catalyst for self growth um, and then the third part of the series is called compartmentalization um, and they have a piece here from that part of the series. Um, and so these works, I, I used what I, well, there's meditative mark making in all of my works, but a specific type of meditative mark making here to create these. Um, and I kind of thought about like the conception behind each piece before creating to kind of get in the right headspace. And so I just like move the pen, but in this like really meditative way, um, kind of, it's interesting you see them all together because all of them look really different and I feel like they kind of match like the concept I was exploring. Um, and so these shapes are representative of energy, but they're confined um, into a space. And that's representative of this need to be aware that like our energy impacts other people and also that other people's energy can impact us and so to kind of be aware of how when you want to release it and what you want to let into your bubble um, and then the last thing I'll say is throughout the series there's a metallic circle in all of the pieces um, and this circle is symbolic of our inner light um, or this um, our spirit or like a universal light um, that kind of when we connect with it can really guide us through day-to-day -day life and, and with intention and, and mindfulness. Are these, uh, are these works in progress or studies? These are completed pieces. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yeah, there's quite a variety of scale in both of your <laughs> larger bodies of work, like in Kind of the way that both of you guys work, there's a huge variety in scale, which I think is lovely. It's really cool. Um, and I do, I love what Courtney said about charcoal. That's so great. And it made me want to put Clark on the spot and ask you about your choice of um, pen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I actually, for two or three years, was using charcoal almost exclusively really? in my mark making process and I was really interested in this idea of carbon being kind of like this building block of life and the thing that's left after um, and I had some like fun experiences like making my own charcoal and thinking about like the process of building the materials that can lead into the artwork and how that makes statements about process within 
the artwork, but um, over the last couple of years, I've made a move towards ink just because I think it's such a uh, ubiquitous material, and there's some graphite works on, on the wall here as well. Um, but using the tools that like we're so familiar with, right? I mean, every single day at some point, I pick up a pen or a pencil and I make a note or I'm in class, right? And I'm sitting, I'm writing. And I think this has become such a ubiquitous tool in all of our lives, but in my life specifically, that it becomes an extension of the body in ways that we don't normally um, like bring our awareness to. So then to use this tool that most of us are very familiar with, um, in a daily practice of meditation, I think it um, calls into awareness the movement of the body, right? So as my hand tracks across this paper, I, I think the viewer is able to see exactly what that movement looks like. So it, it provides a little more access to the documentation as opposed to like a pool of charcoal or like these movements that I was having in earlier bodies of work. Um, where each and every movement becomes articulated as like this finite experience. I think a lot about each line is like a character in a play and they have this entrance and exit from the stage. So this drawing, which we normally think of as, you know, an object that stays the same over a period of time, I think that durational component comes into play a lot more. That my performance of making this can be reenacted as the viewer moves through the artwork or as they enter and exit each work. Um, you know, I think of this as like a larger meditative practice. And every time I sit down with a new sheet of paper, it's re-entering an extension of the same practice. So then the movement through the gallery space becomes really interesting to me of how do changes in scale and the placement from the curator, um, how does that create a line as a viewer moves through the space of a gallery? So I think this becomes activated as this moment of performance as well that maybe in some ways mirrors the process of making that a viewer wouldn't have access to, right, unless they were in my studio with me. Tell us how you get the uh, straight edges. Over here? Yep. Yeah. Right and bottom and side. I'm just doing my best to stop at the so right moment. You yeah. stop. You yeah. Didn't, I, I, for some reason, I just assumed you had tape. No, I, I'm actually really interested in these little subtle deviations. Okay. So when that line carries just a little too far, it doesn't mm -hmm. um, come up. I mean, I think it mimics the decal on the edge of the paper. It kind of creates this fringe look. So I call this piece a weaving. So I, I'm definitely referencing processes of um, fibers, art, and the history of that as it ties into meditative mm -hmm. ritual practices or, um, yeah, religious studies in a lot of ways. So Courtney, the works that we are showing in this show, we talked a lot about charcoal and it was beautiful. But a lot of these are uh, acrylic paint. Yeah. Um, what made that transition a strong choice for you? Um, I typically use acrylic paint. Like really? That's my go-to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Charcoal was a deviation from my norm. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think in this body of work, I was really I had like a concept. Mm -hmm. I used to not do this. It's been really interesting with this body because I think I used to be like in the earlier parts of exploring energy, it was very much like I'm going to meditate and then just like just intuitively paint. Um, and this was like a really big shift for me to really be doing a lot of research, if you will, and, and have a specific idea I'm exploring that I want to convey in each piece mm -hmm. um, and I think with so much awareness into like each part of the painting and the meaning I wanted there to be a congruency in the charcoal pieces with that specific theme and um, so how like, there was just a lot more thought of like so those developed from this Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, cool, I get it. So, <laughs> so typically you work with acrylics and then these were made and then those came after? With the, the first piece I made that didn't make this series was with pencil and charcoal, Oh, which was a deviation. I think yeah. I was just doing a lot of exploring and I was like, if this is what I'm exploring, I feel like charcoal pairs with it. Yeah. But it didn't... Like these words are exploring this idea of this like body of energy that's in everything. 
thing. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that's as congruent with this idea of the life, death, and rebirth, which mm -hmm. was what the second portion was really exploring. And I was like, I don't feel like that should be explored with acrylic. I feel like that should be explored with a natural resource that's also used in art. Cool. That's Something lovely. I noticed, I mean, that I've been thinking a lot as we've played this show has been a commonality of like the response to materials and how that, you know, mirrors um, responses to like experience, maybe in like more of a metaphorical sense. And I feel like as makers, a lot of times, you know, each material becomes this like metaphor for something personally, or also like there's like, I think embedded like politics in every material that we choose. So, you know, the first mark that you make, right, you know, leads to decisions compositionally or um, process wise for the rest of the piece. And that's, I think, one of the things that's most exciting to me when these works exist together in the space. It's, just seeing the way that each of us responded and you know, come to similar conclusions in moments, but also like find deviations, um, all while cent centering around like this, you know, experience like a meditative practice, right? Something that a lot of people would find commonality in. I'm really interested in how we um, deviate in our expression of these experiences, right? Because there's, I feel like there's a lot of connection in our works with personal work, right? Yeah. Like the, the behind, like not actually creating work, but like the side stuff that all goes into creating work. Mm -hmm. uh, like what are we exploring? And you talked to me about your religious studies and 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 this idea of weaving and what it means. And um, I read a lot of poetry and I think that for me with the quantum physics and energy, and I think like these personal studies, like of course are gonna influence what you make. Yeah. And there's so much that we're, exploring that's related mm -hmm. and yet it like it gets explored so differently and it looks so different at the end which is so fascinating absolutely mm -hmm. well let's ask again i think we've we've did so much chatting before mm -hmm. we officially started i'm like no let's talk again about um your strongest influences uh go first go yeah um for me <laughs> I would say one of my strongest influences is Agnes Martin. So mm -hmm. uh, Agnes Martin was classified in the art history textbooks as a minimalist, but if you look at interviews of Agnes Martin, she talked about her work as abstract expressionism. And instead of having the classic, you know, Pollock, frantic, you know, splattering and expressing the soul on the canvas in this chaotic way, um, she was trying to find like the moments of stillness in life. So her nice still lines which were often painted with acrylic or graphite you know onto a canvas um it was trying to find like these moments of stillness and agnes martin was really um inspired by this idea of the grid which has very specific traditions in western art history um she was um, heavily influenced by zen buddhist practices um, her connections to dt suzuki um really inspired this idea of the grid as this like symbol of stillness and i think as i've been making work it started um, really in this line of thinking about the grid and i think right now i'm in a place where i'm trying to figure out the right way to acknowledge the prominence of the grid but also rebel against it right this idea of the stagnant grid with these perfectly straight lines isn't something that feels authentic to me in like a 21st century where Agnes Martin lived off in the desert on top of a hill and you know she was by herself most of the time she had kind of this pseudo monastic practice and that's just not what my life is right I have a partner I have a job I you know have all these relationships in my life that um, are the opposite of like stillness and like quietness that my studio becomes that place to retreat from the world but I also think that finding a more fluid approach to the grid is the way that I rebel against this idea of the perfect, calm, peaceful life as like the end all be all of spiritual approach. I think that um, a more fluid engagement with the ebb and flow of daily life is something that interests me and that's led the work to take on this more organic shape over time. Um, but again, it all kind of starts with research into like the minimalists and the abstract expressionists and thinking about how they may work as a statement to their place and time. And while we acknowledge our lineage as artists, you know, what artists are your mentors or your heroes? 
um, and figure out just how far you follow that inspiration before there needs to be a moment of deviation. I think that's something that I'm considering a lot right now in my practice is where do I need to rebel against the people who have inspired me. I would say that one of my biggest influences is um, Helma off Clint. Our works are not super similar <laughs> visually, but I kind of founded her as I was really diving into this spiritual world, um, which really shifted my work. And a lot of her works are are exploring this, this spiritual realm of something you can't see or touch and you don't know what it looks like and what does it mean. Um, and so she was part of the Transcendental Painting Group, um, which is based in New Mexico, Santa Fe, Taos area. Um, I think there was nine, I want to say nine people in that group of painters. Um, and they took their practice super seriously um, because they were creating these abstracted works. They were geometric. They were fairly colorful. A lot of my work outside of this is fairly colorful. And um, they really wanted to be taken seriously creating spiritual work. And I think that they were really one of the first groups who was tapping that. And so there was this agreement that they were gonna like really take their practice seriously. And there was a lot of thought going into their work and they were up against a lot of challenges. Um, they didn't obviously really find a lot of things until afterwards, but um, they were able to sustain that and they, they kept their practice up. And her works, um, I wanna say in 2019 really hit like a whole new level of popularity um, with a show in New York and now they're traveling and I have not seen them in person. But um, she really explores this idea of the spiritual realm. Um, and it's just really capturing pieces. And like I mentioned before, my work used to be very, went from being really realistic and then <coughs> I like threw that out and made my first really large abstract piece and found such freedom in that. And then I did more of intuitive painting um, for a while. And then I got lost in working <laughs> in corporate America and was not connecting with my work. And I like locked myself in my studio. And I was like, you will reconnect with this and you need to figure out what it is and, and what you want to say. And through this like time of really dedicated spiritual practice and, and artwork and like not really leaving my studio, I all of a sudden was making geometric words. And I was like, this is not normally been my thing. Um, and that's, I was not intending on showing any of the work. It was really like me trying to understand spiritual growth by exploring it on my paper and canvas. And then I was like, this is, this is it. This is the breakthrough. This is why I've been struggling to make art for a while. Um, and her works are also fairly geometric. Um, so, yeah, she's like my, my top. Nice. Yeah, I keep going back and forth to this um, the geometric element in your work, uh, like contrasted against this super expressive, you know, gestural mark making. Mm -hmm. um, I know you've touched on it a little bit, but I just love it. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. I feel like this is like the first section where it's, they're different. Like, mm -hmm. this is the gestural part that represents this, and these are the, the building blocks, right, that come from it. And then the other parts are more geometric and mm -hmm. less gestural. And one of the things that I kind of started exploring as the series went on, so I always really liked the idea of <coughs> mark making. Um, Saitomoli is also one of like my favorite. And I think that like that used to be these like really gestural marks. And as I was going through, they became almost like patterns with inside shapes. Mm. And mm -hmm. still meditative and expressive, but more metric and like I, don't know, I think constrained. Maybe? Yeah. Like, yeah, like given a border. So different. Yeah. I just it's been really interesting and I'm just still I feel like this is so much to explore because this mm -hmm. is like 
it's only been like three years since I've started being like, I make this kind of work that's more geometric, that has pattern instead of this like mm -hmm. movement, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's so much to say. <laughs> and I feel like before, there was so much to say and it was almost like emoting a campus. And now there's so much to say because conceptually, I'm like, what do I want to say and how do I want to say it? And are there certain mediums or patterns here or should I use metallics or like is this opaque is it is it not opaque at all is it just a bunch of patterns together what does it mean and I just there's all these new things to mm -hmm. finding that balance but between what you guys have both described really is like an intuitive action and a structured composition is really fascinating I feel like that yeah. is one of the biggest kind of like breakaway divergences in the way you have both approached. And I think that becomes like partially engaged with like the response of like your thoughts of like a universal force. And that's not necessarily something that I'm like, it's not a word I would initially use in my work, but I think that's what like potentially we're tapping into, right? And there is this balance between the chaotic and the solid or you know the the structure right and i think finding that balance and understanding a, a time and a place for both of those and the coexistence of those things i think that's where really interesting moments of unity arise right as opposed to leaning fully like i was talking about earlier into the grid and thinking about the grid as this like thing of structure or thinking about just the spontaneous right where there's no specific like direction or um, mm -hmm. moment of grounding, but finding that moment of tension in between those two, right? Where you have some sort of order and you're right on the edge of falling into disorder or you're starting in disorder and you're trying to find these like moments of pattern or similarity, I think. Um, that, again, that's something that uh, correlates in the work in a lot of ways, right? Of trying to figure out, and I see that in your work in a lot of ways. It's about this tension, right? Those negative spaces, right? In between the structure and the organic, that's where some really exciting things happen for mm -hmm. me. I would agree. So actually, Courtney, so I just wanted to ask a question about your work. So you were talking about like your spiritual practice and then kind of preparing yourself to put what that energy is onto the canvas. Would you come to the canvas in different mindsets to create those different geometric shapes and then the expressive shapes on the bottom? Or is it like you you just had a set plan and this is what I was gonna do? Or, or did you, like that energy spoke to you and that's what you created that These day? These ones, there was no set plan. Um, it kind of depends on the piece, I think. <clears throat> but for these three pieces, I would have this research that I was doing, um, and then I did. This is this is something I want to explore on the canvas, um, and I would meditate on this like idea, and then and then put it on canvas and see if it landed or not. Um, and then I'd go back to it later. Right? Like I'd keep my studies up and do a lot of yoga and a lot of meditating, and then I'd be like, so this is what I'm still exploring. And these, all for all of these, the top shapes are in response to the bottom. Mm. So sometimes they sat there for like weeks because I was like, I don't, I like, there's so much thought in my work, but I really feel like <laughs> I have art muses that just like visit me and they're like, here you go. And I'm like, great, thank you so much. <laughs> um, it's, it's really what it feels like. And so I think if I'm receptive, then I get more ideas. And if I'm not receptive, then they're like, you are not listening. I'm, like, I'm so sorry. Um, and so I think with these works, this was like step one. And then I would just like have it out like in my main living space and would just like see it half finished. And then in my own practice and research, it's I'm still exploring the same concept, which in this case is this idea of like being in balance. And what does that mean? And I think that I just was like, this is what the outline is gonna look like. And there's gonna be like, it just kind of starts forming conceptually and you just like stare at my canvases and I'm like, this is it. And then I'm, I go up there and I think they're still responding to the work for like from that point. So like I knew the shapes that I wanted them to be and, and how I wanted to have 
the tops of both of these metallic circles be in alignment, even though the bottoms were not, to like be like you're still in balance, right? But this like middle shape right here is actually graphite mixed with medium to kind of just give it this like, I still wanted it to be dark, but I didn't want everything to be black. So that gives it this like luminosity. And then I was like, I still feel like it's such a big shape. And this is such a big shape. Um, I just felt like there had to be more like meditative parts throughout. So like the background up here is also a meditative process to get this background. And here, if you look up really close, there is actually a, a whole another layer of, of pencil scribbles on the top, which is just a whole other layer of meditation and exploration. But to answer your question, all the all the geometric shapes are in response to the gestural shapes. Yeah, I have a similar question for for yours. So, like, you know, looking at it without knowing too much the lines echo each other they're influenced by each other is there a place that you start is there like yeah. you have like a specific you know left to right right to left do you go both ways yeah Top that's to a, bottom? absolutely that's a great question <laughs> yeah so um <clears throat> as i mentioned again i have like this straight line in the center right and i'm responding as i go outward so it radiates mm -hmm. in this piece from the center there's other moments one on the other side of the gallery i start with a straight line right up at the top and i just kind of work my way down and um i've really been loving this scale because i think it references like the format of my body in a lot of ways, right? So the movement across. So yeah, starting with the center, I work my way down, and I work my way up, and then to left and right. And I'm working on tables, so I'm able to adjust, you know, the the drawing as needed. But I'm really thinking about, um, yeah, my experiences from here to here, or what kind of statements does that make? In a lot make? of ways, it is like, uh, you know, when you, you reference Zen, mm -hmm. and this whole uh, stillness of the mind that's, has no language. Yeah. Uh, it's like when it's that still, one little thing, like a, like a pebble in a in a still lake, mm -hmm. it'll ripple out like that. So that's kind of cool that you, you actually mimic that. Yeah, and I'm really interested in this idea of the moment of stillness and where that comes from. I think a lot of times we have this connotation of meditative practices, and I sit and you know, quiet my mind. It's like this commanding thing, I'm going to remove all of these thoughts, I'm going to sit there in perfect stillness. Um, but I'm particularly interested, not just in Zen Buddhism, but in the development of that, as Buddhism moved through China, um, it um, interacted with Taoist practices, right? And this idea of um, Taoist philosophy, um, if you look at the writings of like um, Zhuangzi, you have this um, intense focus on craftsmanship, right? You know, and, and I think craft can be really broad, you know, from somebody carving, you know, a circular form of a wheel like Duanzo would speak about, but even like doing the dishes at night, right? And I think it's not removing yourself from a state of focus to be free. It's going through this state of hyper intense focus, right? I mean, when you're 16 or 15 and learning how to drive, like there's so much that you have to think about, right? And as you develop an affinity for that craft, right? You then find these moments where you're driving all of a sudden I'm at home and I'm wondering, did I run any red lights? Did I take the normal route that I go home? Everything kind of moves to autopilot. Yeah, and you're in that flow, but it only goes through that focus, right? Um, this is, you know, a good example of where we think this happens a lot. But, you know, the teachers say, be quiet and listen to the, you know, the group of children. They're all so focused on listening that they're not actually registering the words that the teacher says. And I think I had that experience in my work sometimes where I'm drawing, I'm trying to find that state of flow, and all of a sudden I, like, fall into it. I get so excited that I finally found the state of flow after however many hours that day, <laughs> and then I lose it immediately, right? But then there's other times where the timer on my phone, you know, my alarm clock that says I need to go home and start making dinner goes off, and I don't necessarily know where the day went, but the drawing was different, and I feel different, and there's been some sort of growth and development, but you can't force that to happen, right? So I think that's the really interesting part of it like a meditative artistic process for me. 
don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, and then the other thing, like I'm just I have two things I wanted to go So the second piece was that it's like record making. Mm -hmm. There's a form of uh, you're recording as you as you make your mark. Yeah. And that it's continuous, it gives you that. Yeah. And that's that has like a lot of I am seeing that too, like even if you look at like LPs and stuff. Mm -hmm. the line, lines on the record that mm -hmm. you can't see it but if you look close enough there's waveforms that create the sounds yeah it's kind of like that absolutely i i consider these to be documents right i'm not yeah. i mean i love the art object i mean i think as a maker you oftentimes become excited about like formal qualities but i'm not composing these pieces right i set up some general rules and as i go i see what comes from that and this becomes a record and I think in this idea of record making, I'm really interested in what else goes along with this, right? And I mean, this is, you know, my kind of loosey goosey interpretation of my own work, but, but I always am wondering like what's carried through these lines, right? I think there has to be some sort of like metaphysical component that, you know, do the lines on a day when I'm tense and, you know, I just, there's a tightness in my hand that's gonna change the way the marks are made and will carry through in the final quality of the piece. So I think there's something, even if we can't articulate it, that has to be translated in the work. So I'm always wondering, you know, what can be accessed aside from this moment of personal interaction where I talk about the experience of the work, but, but what is just implicit in the marks that, you know, somebody might pick up on or uh, might translate and reverberate out into the gallery space. Now, have you played with um, a color palette with this at all? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I think right now I'm really in a place where I'm excited about um, stripping away color in like every sense because it brings me down to kind of like those bare bones of mark making. And I, I try to be really careful with the decisions that I make and I feel like, at least for right now, every color that I choose is so charged with all the baggage that comes with color, right? If you choose yellow, there's certain symbolism and there's references that are made. Um, but what happens if it's like a really intense color versus something that's more muted and pastel, right? These changes carry so much that um, other things I think could cloud, at least in this moment, like the clarity of the mark. Like this is just about putting a mark onto paper and I feel like, um, yeah, but, but I think that's a, a logical next step, right? So I think at some point this needs to come forward um, just as I play back and forth with what happens when I bring up the saturation or, you know, this is a very graphic work. The graphite pieces on the other side of the gallery are so much more subtle that depending mm -hmm. on how you're standing, you might lose sight of this. What would happen if I use black ink on this black paper, right? Where you lose all the image unless you're just looking at this one specific area, right? So these are things that uh, I do play around with in the studio, but I think for right now, this is giving me the clarity of each mark that I'm, that I'm seeking. Yeah. And what's this done on? What, it, I'm using a Stonehenge paper, so I think it's like a cold press, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it comes in large rolls, I mean, okay. kind of cut it to size. Yeah, and I guess that's another thing that I, I really enjoyed about this show is like the substrate becomes so important, right? The paper sitting exposed, but also like the raw canvas. I wonder if you could talk about like the canvas being exposed and like the you know, there's a nice neutral like warmth that comes from that. That's a good contrast to the black paint. Yeah, um, I wanted to be able to use white. <laughs> I mean, on a canvas with Jesse, you can't do that. Oh. It disappears. Um, I think there's something really beautiful about like a, like a raw canvas. Um, it feels so much more connected with the earth um, and, and stripped down um, to its like basic form um and so it felt more congruent i think with like the subject matter um and it gave me more room to play like with the white um i didn't want it to just be black i wanted the i mean this is these were the pieces i started with and i wanted to be able to explore this idea of black and white um and just have 
the metallic really stand out. Uh, and I, I needed a different color background to do that. And this feels like this like perfect neutral to be like, what would you like to do with this? Like the stepping point from there is, is anywhere. Um, it's working with raw canvas is really interesting. So the first time I worked with raw canvas, you don't have to put gesso on it. Um, and so it becomes absorbent and it changes the way you can interact with it. Um, and so you can paint on it not sealed and it will bleed into each other and you can like layer different colors and you can see them all almost like watercolor, which is harder to do with acrylic. Um, and so having the raw canvas kind of allows that and you can do washes. So I had previously worked with raw canvas. Um, when I was doing more of this expressive art, and I think there's just a real beauty to the to the warmth and to the rawness of, of canvas, and I'm hooked on it now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely makes it more like well, less aggressive, and the warmth comes out mm -hmm. from the canvas, it as you know, as opposed to just having a white background. I know when you mentioned yeah, when and when you mentioned that the kind of the larger pieces at the bottom are kind of like a lake of water, that way that the canvas absorbs and spreads that um, pigmented acrylic really conveys that. I think that's lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody have some more questions? I'm just Anybody? curious, Clark, are you also uh, capable of doing illustrative, detailed realism? Yeah, so I, I mean, I teach, um, yeah, I teach drawing, yeah. um, and I, I started as a figurative artist, mm -hmm. like during my undergraduate degree, yeah. and um, I certainly, yeah, I, I firmly believe that I couldn't do this work without a backing in figurative work. I feel like um, I know a lot of the students that I teach that are excited about abstraction initially, like in their freshman, sophomore year, and I'm speaking really broad strokes right now, but I would say a number of them like start with, oh, I want to make abstract work almost as like a fear of like, I can't do the naturalistic, you know, I can't do the figurative stuff. And so they avoid it. But yeah, to me, sitting in a figure drawing class and drawing the figure over and over and over mm -hmm. gave me the opportunity to like find a sensitivity to form, right? Mm -hmm. Like subtle curves or changes in value. And I think that uh, attention is what led to this. And I think at the end of the day, my drawing is about the closeness of looking. And I think that can only be developed um, through like an awareness to the natural world, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it was a figure drawing class that really solidified this kind of stuff for me. I mean, I learned a closeness of looking that moves into here. I would hope like in the gallery space that this serves as another opportunity for that closeness of looking. I think of my work as, or I think of the, the white cube gallery space as like a ritual in a way that we retreat from the world, we come into this place that in some ways is sterile. It could be anywhere, right? And the artwork that exists in the gallery space becomes like this opportunity for us to reframe and question the habits that we have in daily life. So when we leave the gallery space, hopefully that um, newfound awareness of looking carries with us, right? So this attention to detail and the slowness, right? Um, this is something that's very, I think countercultural towards you know this idea of documenting um, what can I accomplish in a day, right? And thinking about the value of every hour that we spend, right? To spend days upon days in a studio space, right? Just repeating lines feels counterproductive in a lot of ways. But then to leave and be able to be aware of those little moments, you know, when I'm on a walk, right? Every moment is something that offers a unique opportunity even if I'm taking the same walk every day or washing the same dishes every night to be aware of those subtle changes. Um, I, I think that's what sticks out the most for me. I, I think that's really interesting what you just said um, about the concept of you making those lines over and over. Um, you know when I, when I look at this piece I wouldn't say that this would make people uncomfortable mm -hmm. but when people they they would like they have a hard time thinking that it's not mechanical mm -hmm. and I think that's because it's it they're confronted with their own 
like inability to slow down and make those marks and the commitment it takes to doing that meditative process, they would be much more comfortable with it being something mechanical as opposed to Absolutely, yeah, the process. Absolutely, yeah, program. Yeah, yeah. to make the painting, to, to Then we the miss drawing. all the subtleties. Like, yes. you know, when you talk about the grid and, and we look at it, you know, we can see the center axes, the Y and the X axis, if you will. And, but you can also see corridors of darker white, lighter, black coming through. I mean, you see all these other, it's, it's like, you know, what is that game? It's like, okay, how many boxes are in here? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's, I think that you've definitely accomplished challenging us on the grid here. Thank you. Thank you. It's funny you said the white cube um, and people going in and, and that it's kind of, I, it's similar, I think of art now as this, like, invitation. Like, all art that I interact with, I'm like, this is an invitation for reflection and introspective time and transformation. And all art, I think, is really this, like, outstretched hand for people when they enter into a gallery. Um, I mean, I've been thinking of my works as like these hall passes where like here's your permission slip to go like explore and take the time to kind of like really dive into your own mind and like to explore like the universe at large and and there's this kind of like offering I think of like here's a here's some time, some minutes, however long you're here to be curious and see what stirs up for you. And I think it's so interesting, like what people connect with, like what I connect with when I'm in the gallery, or like what other people connect with, and like what does that mean? Like, what are they exploring? Like, this is it. This was able. Like, I wish you could just like read people's minds. Too. Like, this is like I sat from this work, and like this is what I felt from it. But someone else will feel something so different, and it's just like I feel like that's like the best part about art is like. Oh, it's the it best part about us sitting around in the gallery during the day. It's <laughs> like it's a sacred space. Yeah. 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 Thank you guys so much. Thank you I, so much. And you know, just to give us a few more minutes to make sure we haven't missed asking you questions we really want to know the answers to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you have one. Yeah, what, what, what? No, no. Go ahead. Just, Clark, I'm curious. The, the, the I. You just spoke about bringing a concept, and you were talking about bringing fabric mm -hmm. in these textiles. What's on the horizon? Is there another? Are you playing with another idea? Yeah, um, I I heard this fairly recent in an artist talk, and it goes back to a quote of um, John Baldessari. He's talking about um, um, cliche in art, and he said, "You know, the idea of." Um, you know, making art that doesn't feel cliche is taking a cliche as like a dull pencil, right? You know, over time your pencil gets dull and then it's these ideas that keep getting reused. And he said the only way to solve that is to tilt the pencil on its edge, right? You find a new sharp edge. And a lot of artists who deal with, um, you know, tropes or ideas that have been reused, um, they just have to find a new angle, right? And all of a sudden it becomes this really interesting, exciting thing. And my process really mirrors that in a lot of ways of, um, I mean, I'm slow to process things. I feel like I want to really work through an idea. So, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues have these like big changes in there. Right? You know, every year you could probably classify, you see the work, this is what they're making in 2019, this is what they're making in 2020. And I don't think my work shows that, but I just make these like subtle shifts, right? So while I've been working on kind of these grid systems, um, I've been doing what I've called like a pilot series, um, like a pilot of a TV show. It might have a following season, but it might not, um, with these geometries and thinking about instead of just starting with a straight line, what happens when I start with a geometric form and I radiate out or pull in from there? I think that's um, what's going to come next, but also just think about like the subtlety of the mark, you know, what happens with something's more graphic, black on white or white on black versus finding more neutrals, a little bit less contrast that draws the eye in in a closer way. I think that's what I'm going to be considering probably the next year or so. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that was absolutely my question. Yeah. What's next? <laughs> but so now Corbin has yeah. to answer. <laughs> um, I have a couple ideas floating. The one I'm currently working on is this idea of um, tree of life, sure. but flowers. Okay. So like a flower of life, and they're very geometric. Um, the same idea of like mark making, creating these like textures. Um, almost like portals, I think, to like the spiritual realm. So hmm. that's currently hmm. exploring. So organic portals, mark making. I'm excited to see what comes yeah. out of that. Like, that's going to be interesting. I think Very cool. Well, thank you again so much, you guys, for your time. Thank you. I uh, yeah, appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, this is sure. lovely. Thank you. thank you for joining us and for trusting us with um, sharing your work with an, our audience. Um, the show is up for quite a while. We have an official opening reception next weekend, so we'll mm -hmm. see you then. And then Courtney is actually teaching a meditation and mark making workshop on May 26th. Um, and I believe you could sign up for that um, anywhere the firehouse has an internet presence. There should be some kind of link or info about it. Congrats again, Clark, on your graduation. Thank you. Yeah, thank cool. you. Um, yeah, again, thank you guys. Take a bow. Sign it out. Excellent.